Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Jalik Rainwalker? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the disappearance, then offer my analysis. Jalik Rainwalker was born in Albany, New York on August 2, 1995. At that time, his last name was Boyd. His mother was addicted to alcohol and cocaine. Jalik was placed in the foster care system. From ages 4 to 7, he was with a family in Clifton Park, which is about a half hour north of Albany. They were about to adopt him, but he had emotional outbursts, which were too much for them to handle. In July 2003, Jalik was adopted by a couple, Stephen Kerr and Jocelyn McDonald. Stephen and Jocelyn both worked as weavers. They lived in Salem, New York, which is just over an hour northeast of Albany, right near the border with Vermont. The couple had three biological children and another foster child. They decided to change Jalik's last name to Rainwalker, something they came up with when they were walking through the rain. I'm guessing this couple is not going to be nominated for any awards based on originality. Considering the name came from their personal experience, the name Fire Sprinter would have made a better conversation starter at parties, or if they wanted to impress people with their work ethic, Snow Shoveler would have been good. Stephen and Jocelyn moved about 15 minutes away to a one-room cottage in Greenwich, New York. It did not have any electricity or plumbing. They wanted to exist in a way that was environmentally friendly. Later, they moved just outside this town to another one-room cottage. Now moving to the timeline of the disappearance. In October 2007, Jalik ran into some trouble in his home school group. He was being annoyed by another child and allegedly made a sexually explicit comment. Jocelyn McDonald, again, this is Jalik's adoptive mother, banned Jalik from the home which meant that Stephen and Jalik had to move out. They moved into Stephen's parents' home. The parents were not at the house at this time. A respite foster care provider named Elaine Person agreed to care for Jalik for six days. This was until Thursday, November 1, 2007. Elaine said that she would take Jalik back the following Tuesday. She just needed a few days to go to New York City. On November 1, at 7 p.m., Elaine dropped off Jalik to Stephen in a hotel parking lot in Albany, New York. Elaine said that Jalik was looking forward to returning to her home on Tuesday. She noticed Stephen's minivan parked at the hotel, but Stephen wasn't in it. She placed Jalik's bags in the minivan, knowing that Stephen would be back shortly. When Stephen came back to the vehicle, he was upset that she opened his van without permission. He also should have been upset with himself for leaving his vehicle unlocked. Stephen and Jalik left the hotel parking lot and went to a Red Robin restaurant in Latham, New York, which is just north of Albany. A server at the restaurant noticed that Stephen wasn't happy after she mixed up his order. This incident was reported as if it was meaningful. However, one possible cause for Stephen's unhappiness was the performance of the server. It's not unusual for people placing an order in a restaurant to want that order to be correct. At some point on the journey, Stephen received a phone call from a friend of his who said that the way Stephen was talking about Jalik was very harsh, very critical, and very judgmental. Sounds like the person liked the word very. Stephen was making these negative comments right in front of Jalik. Again, they were in the same vehicle. He was worried about Jalik's behavior, especially the sexual comments that Jalik allegedly made. Stephen would later say that after leaving Red Robin, he drove directly to his parents' house in Greenwich. He and Jalik spent the night there. The next morning, November 2, 12-year-old Jalik was nowhere to be found. There was a piece of loose-leaf paper on the kitchen table which contained a message in Jalik's handwriting. The note said, quote, Dear everybody, I am sorry for everything. I won't be a bother anymore. Goodbye, Jalik, unquote. 
Stephen notified the police, and they started to investigate the disappearance. Stephen said that the night before, he stayed up and watched a movie after Jalik went to bed. Stephen never left the house that night. He informed the police that Jalik had probably run away. Two days later, the police launched a search effort. Stephen did not participate. Within a few weeks after Jalik disappeared, Stephen and Jocelyn started paperwork to invalidate the adoption, although the disappearance functionally achieved that same goal. I guess they were saying that if Jalik ever came back, they didn't want him. Three months after Jalik disappeared, Stephen and Jocelyn moved to Vermont. The police considered Stephen a person of interest, but they have never charged him or accused him of anything. Stephen has denied any wrongdoing. No sign of Jalik Rainwalker has ever been found. The police have classified this case as a probable homicide. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. Jalik had difficulty in controlling his anger and was challenging to manage. Some people believed that he may have had reactive attachment disorder. Not long before his disappearance, his behavior was getting increasingly erratic, which appears to support the theory that he ran away. The goodbye note written in Jalik's handwriting is convincing evidence that he left of his own accord. The FBI confirmed that Jalik was the author of the note. Elaine Person, again this is the respite foster care worker, said that the note may have been from a previous homework assignment. Jalik had to write an apology to some of his homeschool classmates. This seems like a pretty strange assignment considering the nature of the note. Again, the note read, Dear everybody, I am sorry for everything. I won't be a bother anymore. Goodbye, Jalik. If this was just an apology note, why did it contain the word goodbye? Was leaving forever also part of the apology? This seems kind of strict. Item number three, Stephen's behavior after the disappearance caught the attention of investigators for several reasons. Stephen was video recorded ripping down signs, asking for the public's help in finding Jalik. He told reporters he could not talk to them because he had to go sell eggs. At one point, Stephen did sit down for an interview with a reporter. He said something to the effect of, there are so many children dying in Iraq right now. Why are we spending all this time and energy on one kid? Stephen supplied a few theories to the police about what could have happened to Jalik. For example, he may have joined a gang and be living with a black family in Albany or Troy. Perhaps he was a victim of sex trafficking or a religious group may have kidnapped him. Stephen appears to understand why the police are so interested in him. He said, quote, I could understand how people picture me as a prime suspect. That is completely understandable. All they want to do is string me up and hang me, but they don't have any evidence, unquote. Item number four, just after midnight on November 2, the day of the disappearance, a bank surveillance camera captured a minivan similar to Stevens, Chrysler Town & Country. The van was driving through Greenwich. It cannot be determined if this is Stevens' van, but if it was his van, this is inconsistent with his story about him staying at his parents' house all night. Item number five, what do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. Jalik was a troubled boy who could not manage his anger. This meant that people did not want to adopt him. He felt rejected, unwanted, and worthless. The alleged incident involving the inappropriate comments was shocking to Stephen and Jocelyn to such a degree that Jocelyn banned Jalik from the home. This was a powerful rebuke. He was sent into exile, which meant that Stephen had to accompany him for at least a while. This probably did not make Stephen too happy. This was worse than having a restaurant mix up his order. Stephen had arranged for respite foster care. There was a gap in the care, therefore Stephen had to pick up Jalik and take him back to Greenwich. Stephen was probably getting quite upset by this point. Caring for Jalik was becoming extremely inconvenient. Stephen was not subtle about his contempt, like on the phone call with his friend where he was judgmental 
and harsh when referring to Jalik. The weight of all these events was heavy on Jalik. He felt unloved and unwanted. He wrote an apology note and left Stephen's parents' residence. No stolen vehicles were reported in the Greenwich area. Nobody reported anyone stealing food or anything like that. This makes it seem like Jalik may have run into bad actors and was murdered, or perhaps he went somewhere and died from another cause, like exposure. Other than Stephen's unusual behavior, there is no reason to believe that he was involved in Jalik's disappearance. I think the police focused on Stephen because he seemed callous and clearly did not want Jalik to be a part of his life. The police have no idea what happened, which is exemplified by the fact that they used psychics to find Jalik. Historically, psychics have claimed to be able to find people who have been separated from their earthly existence. In reality, they are far better at finding people who are ready to be separated from their earthly money. Now moving to my final thoughts. What lessons can be learned in this case? Children in the foster care system sometimes have behavior problems, which makes caring for them challenging. When a child is angry, obnoxious, or belligerent, it can be easy for foster or adoptive parents to forget that the child has feelings. It can be easy to view the child as annoying, hopeless, and irredeemable. Perhaps that's what happened in this case. Stephen had just given up on Jalik. Furthermore, Stephen's feelings of irritation were communicated to others after the disappearance, which made him seem insensitive, detached, and cold. It drew suspicion on him. Stephen complained about being targeted by the police, but it was his own lack of insight that drew the attention of the authorities. Those are my thoughts in the case of Jalik Rainwalker. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis to be as intriguing as sprinting through fire, only to then walk in the rain. Thanks for watching.